Well, I met Sam Cooke when we were both about, oh, around not quite teenagers. We hadn't made it to teenagers yet. We thought we were bad, but I was singing in a junior choir, and he was singing in his daddy's church. Not much, you know, but then we formed a little, we formed our little quartet, see, because we used to go to the Regal Theater and see the live stage shows. And naturally, after we'd see the show, we saw, like, the Drifters and the Moon Glows and the Five Satins, you know, the groups that were popping that day. And then we would go back and stand on the corner and do wop like they did, you know, not realizing that we were going to eventually become professional singers. But then Sam, uh, they had this group, this group was called the Highway QCs. I don't know why they called them that, but that's what they called them. And, of course, Sam was the person. I mean, he had that voice that mesmerized people. Every Friday night, all the quartets in the city would meet up there, and they would have like what they call like a, you know, battle, you know, quartet battle. It wasn't no battle, but, you know, that was the thing. Who was the best, you know? You had the groups from the west side that would come over, and then the groups from the south side. Well, now the groups from the south side, that's where the soul stirred lived, so they were like the number ones. Then you had the Norfolk singers, you know, and we would meet up there, at 3838 State Street, which was a little storefront church. Really, that's all it was. But it was where everybody would come because they knew they were going to get to hear all the quartets in the city, the North Lee Brothers and the Norfolks and the Midwest Wonders of uh, uh, Pop Staples. He sang with the Midwest Wonders, you know. And that was cool because at the time we were still kids, so we didn't really make any distinctions, you know, just who, dre- who looked the best. That was it, you know. You, we all would go to the west side and buy our suits. And if it rained on them, we were in big trouble. Did the QC stand out particularly among the groups in in Chicago? And, did, and what about yes. what about radio? I mean, WIMB. Well, yes, because see, on Sunday morning you go there and you pay. Uh, what was his name, Jack? Oh, I can't remember his name, but he had the radio, he had the gospel show on Sunday morning. And what we would do is we'd all get our little money together, put our money together. But we had to pay him. We had to pay to get on there, you know. That's how he paid for the time on the radio. And everybody would, you know, dippy up their little three or four or five dollars, you know, and and go up there. And of course, uh, Sam, well, he Sam didn't have to pay. But see, the thing that made them so popular was because M.L. Itson had a brand new car, you know. He had a Cadillac then, you know. And I mean, when they pull up in a Cadillac, whoa, who is that? That's the QCs, man, you know, big time. Everybody else was pulling up in T Model Four, not no, not T Model Four. You know what I mean? <laughs> Cars looked like they was gonna fall apart, you know, and they did. But, <laughs> but that was the thing. See, that's and because of that, they got to travel more naturally. You know, they could go like to Milwaukee, Detroit, St. Louis, Cleveland, and like that. First time I went on the road was with him. First time I came to California. I helped him drive out here. We stopped in, uh, let's see, we stopped in St. Louis. We stopped in Kansas City. And then we stopped in Vegas, man. But we didn't get no further than the west side, you know. (laughs) Because that's where the church was. And we stayed with some people because they didn't have hotels and things, you know. They had a hotel. Yeah, they did. They had the Moulin Rouge Hotel Motel. But we didn't stay there. Because it was full, so the minister let us stay at some of the folks' houses, which was cool. And then we came on to California, and they were having the National Quartet Convention. And Sam slayed them. Boy, he killed them, man. You know. And uh, that's and then he, that's when he met Bumps Blackwell. Because Bumps was at Specialty Records, where the Soul Stirs were recording. But he had patterned himself after Reba Harris. So naturally... Crane and you know Solster, they said this is this is the boy. So they got him. But so you thought he was ready when he joined when he joined the stairs? Yeah, he was ready for gospel. Yes, he was ready for gospel because he had. I mean, you know, like I said, we we didn't uh, we had no idea about going into the secular world. You know, because we were all in. We were going to church. You went to church every Sunday or else, and you didn't want to know what else was. So you went to church. Well, my reaction, like all the other people, you know, that knew him and grew up with him and had been around him, was, 
are they going to accept it? You know, are they going to accept the gospel singer turn pop? You know, of course, they called him a rhythm and blues singer. I mean, you send me, I'm still trying to figure out how they could figure out you send me with rhythm and blues. But the reason he did that because he was black. He was a model for everybody. He was a model for everybody because you remember right after he did, well, not right after, but it wasn't long after that Aretha came out. It wasn't long after that the Staple family came out. And there were numerous others, you know, that came along at the same time that had been gospel-oriented, gospel-trained. Because that's the best school in the world. If you want to be in the music, you know, if you want to be a singer, go to church. Because you learn a lot. You learn tonality, you know. You know when you're off key and all that stuff because you're singing it within a group. So you got to find your place in there. Once you do that, you find your place within instrumentation when you're playing with music. If you're brought up in the religious world, you know, uh, if you are sincere, you never really get away from it. Not that you have to be the diehard, be there. I got to go every, you know, I got to be there every time the door open. No. As long as you got the spirit within you, and Sam did, he had that. That's why I think he was uh, as successful as he was, because he never left his roots. We put the tour together here in L.A. We, we rehearsed with the orchestra and everything, with Bob Tate's orchestra, and put the show together. And, of course, we were the group, the travelers. See, we didn't take the Pilgrim Travel, because the Pilgrim Travel, that was the gospel group. But when back in Sam, we were the, you know, the travelers, you know, that was cool, you know. <laughs> and uh, we went out, man, and we were on the road, boy, and we had we had a, a little pickup truck with one of those cabs on the back, you know. That's where they carried all the instruments in. And we had a bus and a car. Sam had a brand new 58 Cadillac convertible, man. Oh, we were cool. Well, naturally, I rode in the car with him. And, <laughs> and we went, boy, we went to some places where they had to pump daylight to the people. They were so far back out in the woods. <laughs> One thing about the gospel feel, it was different than the secular world. In the South, if you were a gospel singer, you were embraced. Right? You still had to go in the black door and drink from the black fountain and go in the black bathroom. But they still, you know, gave you some some semblance of respect you know because you were you were serving God now when we went back down there secular people wrong oh you boys serving the devil we don't you know and that was the attitude but uh, it was weird man and the farther south we got the worse it got his appeal was universal I mean color had no meaning you know, because his music was universal. You know, it wasn't like, you know, Papa got a brand new bag. You know what I'm saying? It was, darling, you send me. Everybody could relate to that. Everybody did relate to it. He was, I guess you could say, one of the one of the forerunners of trying to create an area, an attitude, or or a an ambiance to give people. Well, like like uh, Bobby Womack, the Womack brothers, and they had the, the Sims twins, you know, great talents, but they they just couldn't get over because they couldn't get in the door, you know. So Sam was, uh, I guess he was he was gonna be a Barry Gordy before Barry Gordy was Barry Gordy. Anyway, <laughs> that makes sense. Anyway, you know, but that was his thing. That was what he wanted. He just wanted to. Uh, that create a vehicle to give, you know, young talent a chance. What was Sam like as a producer? He was good. It, I don't know. You know, you know, there are people, uh, and I've seen this, there are some people that in life that just have the knack. They have the touch. They don't have no training. You know what I mean? They don't have any schooling as far as that goes. But it's just, it's just an inherent thing. It's it just... It's just there. They just do it. They just know. Now, I mean, as far as being the engineer and all that stuff, no. But he had the ears. He had the sound. He knew the moods. He knew the, the movements and stuff. And that's what he would impart. I mean, he wrote great songs because he drew from 
everyday life, you know. I mean, he would sit on the floor at my mom's house, and like when he wrote Only 16, having a party and stuff like that, he was sitting on the, in the living room floor with a guitar. And then I would, you know, of course, being there with him, and we haven't sang with him so much, I knew him, you know, musically, vocally, and I'd just harmonize with him. And then when he'd go to the studio, I'd go to the studio and harmonize with him, not realizing that they turned the machines on. See, that was a trick. That's why they tricked us, man. They tricked me. They'd be there. We'd be standing there rehearsing, I thought, you know, just going over it. And they would turn the machine on, see. And then they would record it. And then I'd be driving down the street about a month or so later, and they'd turn the radio and said, Sam Cook's brand new release. And there I was. He came by my house. My son was about maybe six months old. And I had a dog, a German shepherd named Dina. And Dina would always lay under my kid's crib. And when Sam walked in the room, the dog got up and left the room and my son started crying. And then about two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, my phone rang and my mom said, Lou, I said, well, she said, Sam is dead. I said, what? And I jumped up and went over to the house he was living in Los Feliz. And of course, you know, it was, whew, God, I mean, it was just wild, crazy. And then about, I don't know, it was a few months after that, I was thinking, and my grandmother had raised me, she said, animals and babies can see death. And that hit me, I said, mm, that's what it was. The dog, when Sam walked in the room, the dog got up and walked out the room, and my son started crying. Sam went over and picked him up and said, what's the matter with you, man? And Lou just, he just, just sobbing, crying. Sam put him down, left. We would sit out in the living room and talk for a while. And that's when he told me he was going to meet these jockeys from K-Day at, P at PJ's that night. And John said, meet him. I said, well... I think Lou is six, so if that, I'm going I'm to, you know, kind of stay close to home. And to this day, I wish if perhaps had I gone, things wouldn't have turned out the way they did. But, you know, yeah. But he was cool, dude. Sam the man. He was the man.